I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music and our interview with the great Elliot Randall. We start with the most obvious questions about him recording the guitar on Reeling in the Years. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. Remember, if you want to support the channel, there are links in the description. You can either buy a t-shirt, make a donation on PayPal, or join our Patreon. Here's Elliot Randall. Tell me about the uh, um, the guitar solo, that famous... Oh my God! It, it I remember thinking it's the song with a a guitar solo or no a, a guitar bridge, uh, but tell me about your part in that. Well, um, the reason I was asked to come and play to begin with for that song was Donald and Walter couldn't find themselves being happy with anything that was coming in in the intro. Right, you know, different people tried different things and it just wasn't making them happy. So I get a call, Elliot, would you come and play on this thing? We'll see what we see what happens. We're at the village recorder, such and such at night. I went. Uh I played it. I asked him to play it down once so that I could get an idea of what the tune was. And I had I hadn't demoed it with him earlier, so it was brand new to me. And I liked it. I liked several things about it. I liked the lyrics. I liked <clears throat> Denny's part was down already. Um, and it felt Celtic to me, Denny's part, you know, which basically Donald had written out. Now that you and mention so, it. Yeah. Hmm? Now that you yeah. mention it. Yeah. It's totally Celtic. So <clears throat> I did a um, an EP back about a little after the turn of the century, in which I did my own version of Reeland. And I used a lot of Celtic musicians. Uh, I'm friends with Bill Whelan, the guy who wrote River Dance. So he got me all these wonderful, wonderful, you know, fiddlers and Byron players. And we did it a, a very different version. And I used Chuck Rainey and Bernard Purdy as part of the rhythm section so that it bridges the gap between the two styles. Um, but yeah, so... <clears throat> Here I am loving the tune, saying, can I see a copy of the lyrics, please? So they did. They showed me the lyric. I said, great. Okay, let's let's give it a try. They ran the tape. And <clears throat> I finished playing from beginning to end. And Gary went, that's it. That's it. We got it. And <clears throat> in the back, he had the, the little tape engineer, the tape, uh, tape operator going, oh, I never pressed the red button. <laughs> So whether or not it was as good as or better than what you're hearing now, we'll never know. Um, having said that, the next take was a, another one taker all the way through. And what you're hearing is what I did. They actually pulled out a couple of extra fills, which you wind up hearing in the quad version, which I'm not that crazy about. But I thought it was just, it really worked really well. Jimmy Page loves it. I love Jimmy Page loving it. <laughs> That's amazing. The fact that Jimmy Page, I mean, of course, and listen, there's a part of, of, of every artist that has, oh, it's just little old me. You know, it's just like, but I hate to, to ask you an obvious question, but you get it, right? Like that is a monumental stop in your seat, staring at the speaker's moment in music. It's a heck of an acolyte. You know, and uh, I mean, I, I I I first met Jimmy back in 1967. He was on tour with the Yardbirds, and they were playing in Lima, Ohio, which is where I used to teach. Um, and we got on like a house on fire. And then we hadn't really seen each other bar a couple of times, you know, when Zeppelin played the Garden or whatever. And you know, when I heard that he complimented me on that, I was like, oh, "That's really, really nice." He doesn't have to, you know. He's he's a guitar god, isn't he? So, you what's know, your what's you know, your opinion on him on 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 the Zeppelin thing? I'm just kind of curious, and uh, I mean, his music. Um, he's he's a great creator. He's a really really good creator. Um, he understands intrinsically what it takes to make a really good sounding record. Of course, Jimmy was a studio guitar player in London for years before Ze Zeppelin. So, um, you know, he just had it he and still has it. 
my philosophy since like 1969, when I was with the group C train, uh, we had a horrible breakup with the singer. And um, as it turned out, I sort of formed this um, opinion based on what I know about families. And I had been involved with psychology for quite a while. I think bands are <clears throat> essentially dysfunctional families. Um, no matter how much you all love each other, at some point, something's going to rock the boat to the point where it tips. And so, you know, I mean, I wish all bands the very, very best of luck. And obviously some have been able to work their way through it over all the years. But in general, I like to be happy. And so to me, um, the two, two of the biggest moments of happiness for me would be being in the studio and creating, uh, which sometimes can be really quite a challenge because it's not just you being creative, it's you also being creative and making your client, the producer, the artist, the engineer, making everybody feel like, yeah, this is really right. And sometimes it comes in an instant. Um, I mean, the real end thing was, you know, it was a one taker. So it was like, yeah, they should all be like this. But in reality, they're not all like that. So sometimes you got to work a little extra hard. And you, um, you know yourself, though, that's, the, you know, I, I, I've heard you say this before about not wanting, sorry to interrupt you, but there's no, something there's some people sometimes, I mean, the machinery, which is you. I mean, the thing is, sometimes when people aren't aware of what's good and bad for them, it's I mean, I know the conversation you had with Jimi Hendrix, uh, Isle of Wight. I mean, that that's a, a cautionary tale of but all that stuff. It's like you, you got information over here and over here. And you, you, you obviously knew when money gets involved in bands, things get complicated. But it's almost like you took all this in. I mean, you were paying attention. Yeah, <laughs> not all the time. Uh, because, look, we all have to make mistakes, and those mistakes prove to be life lessons. Um, I remember oh, back in the early 70s, I was managed by the Robert Stigwood organization, and I had just come off of an Eric Mercury tour, and Rick Gunnell, who's this really legendary British manager come uh, rogue but I say that with a lot of heart because I, I, I always loved him. Um, and Cam comes over to me. Uh, we're at the Whiskey A Go-Go, actually. I, it, it's very, a, very, a very vivid memory. And he's smoking this great big Cuban stogie. And he says, kid, I'm going to make you a star. Are you on for it? Yeah, great. You know, not realizing all of the mechanics behind what, making a star is all about. So he signed me with Polydor Records. I got signed to the Stewart organization. Everything was great. And then you realize that it's less great than you think. I got you a $250,000 contract, which back in 71 was a lot of dough. But the 250,000 contract covered five albums. So all of a sudden, each album's 50,000. <laughs> And, you know, stuff like that. That's just, it's the way of the world. Um, and with all of the things that I've learned and some of the things that I haven't, I try now to approach making music in a way that simply makes me happy. If I can sell some of my product, and when I say product, and it sounds awful, but it, it is product, uh, whether it's a painting or a, or a piece of music, um, that makes me happy because it's, you know, it pays for my hobby. <laughs> um, I just love to be in my studio. This is my little production room and it's just filled with goodies and I can come up here. I can avoid some of the news because, you know, a steady stream of news is not that good these days. And, um, I just, I'll either work on something, a project that I've already started for somebody else or for myself, or, I'll open up a blank session and look at it and say, this is my palette, right? And I like to think that I make sound paintings. 
I mean, some of them are, you know, on the commercial end of it, and some of them are pretty far out. But it makes me happy to do it. Yeah. So we'll have more from Elliot Randall in a couple of days. Remember, he was a session guitarist for Steely Dan, Frankie Valley, Paul Lanka, two of the Kiss members' solo albums, Gene Simmons, Peter Chris. He worked with the Village People, Richie Havens, Peter Frampton, Yoko Ono, Carly Simon, Carl Wilson, Laura Nero, Kirsty McCall, and many others. Remember, if you want to support the channel, all the links are in the description. You can make a donation at PayPal, join our Patreon, or buy a t-shirt. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music.